it's always funny when I'm online and I can see all these, you know, all these headlines and articles of millennials and, you know, <laughs> they're millennials never they're crashing the housing market and millennials yeah. don't own houses and they're millennials this. And I'm like, it's not me. I'm good, you know? And so, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, thanks to, thanks to the army for sure um, yeah. for affording that, uh, that opportunity. Welcome to the Military Bottom Line Podcast, where we learn from veterans and those currently serving how to make the most out of a military contract. We are here to motivate, inspire, and help you leverage your service to positively impact you professionally, personally, and financially during your military career and beyond. Welcome to episode 41 of the Military Bottom Line Podcast. Super grateful for you guys tuning in today. I've got an awesome guest. Neville Williams is a captain in the U.S. Army. He's been in eight years now and is about to transition out. Uh, he, Neville's had a, had a great run at it. He's done a lot of cool things, jumping out of airplanes. Uh, he did a ROTC scholarship to kind of enter in as a commissioned officer. And uh, he's got a good story of kind of like bargaining with the recruiters and bargaining with his um, you know, the leverage he had as a new, uh, new officer coming in to make sure that he got the job he wanted and was really able to kind of like direct his military career and stations where, uh, where he wanted for the most part. So I think he's got, you know, a lot of lessons to learn from. He's used the opportunity in the army to, you know, pursue entrepreneurial efforts, uh, financial freedom and, you know, laying a strong financial foundation. And now he's heading out of the army and going to go pursue some master's programs in Australia, all covered by his VA benefits. So I think you guys are going to really enjoy uh, this conversation and this interview. I know I did. And uh, Neville's, uh, you know, one to aspire to be and, and emulate because he's done very well for himself. So I hope you guys enjoy this show. What's going on, Neville? Thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm excited. Thank you, man. Thank you. I know we uh, we connected. You stumbled upon one of my YouTube videos. And so I, I love uh, connecting with people that like I, I find on the internet, provide hopefully some value to you and kind of pay it forward and give you the opportunity to provide value to others based on your experience. And so I'm excited to hear your story and, you know, hopefully uh, help somebody else out. Yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me. You know, it was yeah, it was just randomly, you know, I'm on YouTube, just you know, wasting life away. And then when your videos <laughs> popped up and then I was just like, Oh, let me check this out. I think it was one, it was about the post nine 11 GI bill. Yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. And then I was like, yeah, let me check. Oh, this guy seems pretty solid. Let me, you know, add him on Instagram and then here we are. So yeah, awesome. Man. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear your story. Like I said, um, you know, it looks like you're captain in the army right now. And so I you know we've talked a little bit about what you're uh, hoping to do afterwards. So I'd love to kind of get a, you know, start in the beginning as to like how you ended up in the army in the first place. Yeah. So, uh, for your audience, you know, I, I'm captain Neville Williams. I am the commander of the San Fernando Valley army recruiting company here in Los Angeles. Um, I got five stations in my company. Our area encompasses pretty much just East of Encino all the way West to Ventura. Um, and that's our, AI, that's our AO. Uh, I'm not from Los Angeles originally I'm from the great state of uh, South Florida, which is pretty, Pretty different culturally from North uh, North Florida, you know, or some other parts. Um, pretty humble beginnings. You know, I come from single family home, uh, mom raising five kids, you know, tails out of time, mm. uh, just, you know, lower middle class, just trying to do her best, you know, to make it happen. So shout out to all the single parents out there, you know, doing your best. Um, didn't really have a lot of opportunities growing up. Um, it was somewhere around... I want to say 10th grade or so when I really, I think that's when I, when I joined my high school's army JROTC program. Okay. And, you know, I was, I was kind of messing around with that. Um, I, I had the idea that I wanted to join the army. Mm -hmm. Um, initially uh, it's funny. I wanted to be a drill sergeant. That's like all I wanted to do, you know, <laughs> seeing drill sergeants on TV, just running around, yeah, yelling at privates, letting them do pushups and stuff. And I was like, I can do that. That's too easy. Right. Um, but, but, but as time passed on, you know, my senior army instructor, he was like, I guess he saw something in me that I probably didn't, you know, see in myself. Mm. He was like, Hey, no, you got a commission. You know, you have to be an officer. You have to be leading soldiers. And so, you know, we talked, I did, did some paperwork, had a couple of interviews here and there. Next, you know, I have a, a four year army ROTC scholarship awesome. uh, to attend. Yeah. To attend the university of North Georgia. Um, pretty much, you know, no money out of pocket. So that, that was the first step that propelled me onto this path. Good for you. So you were, I mean, 
I know a lot of people join the military because they're like not feeling college, you know, like, and that's why mm-hmm. I joined. Um, but at that point in your life, you you felt good about going to college first, and that that didn't really rub you the wrong way at all. No, I I, I actually I wanted to go to college. Like okay. I, I I don't know why, but that that was just like uh, I had to go to college. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was kind of a you know if this whole military thing doesn't work out, I'm going to need something to fall back on. So I, sure. I need to have some sort of skill set you know, to, to help me in the civilian side, if I don't make it 20 years in the military. For sure. For sure. And it, it sounds like, you know, I don't want to say it. it's not like you, you didn't necessarily pick the army. It's just because you were an army ROTC or JROTC. Yeah. Yeah. So there was, there were a lot of influence and, you know, army influences, yeah. uh, really before, even before high school, mm. um, I, I was in the boy scouts. So, so there's, okay. I, I guess, you know, there's a little bit of military influence there kind of, and I was also a part of this, you know, growing up, um, in the church, we had this program called Pathfinders. Um, mm. and it, it's similar to Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, but, and there's some military aspects where, you know, that we had drill and ceremony and we did, um, you know, we had a chain of command. Um, but obviously it was very heavily like, you know, religion, religious uh, oriented. Sure. Um, so I had some influences here and there. Um, but definitely when I got into high school and, and was in the JRTC program, you know, that kind of like solidified, you know, me joining the army. Nice. Nice. Okay. So you did, uh, let's talk a little bit about the ROTC program. Cause I, I think I've only had one other person talk about that. Um, mm-hmm. what is that, what does that look like? What is that transaction between you and the army and the school? Yeah. So I started out in high school in the JRTC, the junior reserve officer training corps. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just kind of like, you know, it's an elective class in high school where, you know, once in a while you show up in uniform, you know, you have a chain of command, you have your, you know, your cadet company commander, first sergeant, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Um, and then you just, it's really about developing you as a, a young leader, essentially. Mm. And like I said, I got an ROTC scholarship to go into college. Um, so I attended the University of North Georgia, which is actually one of the six senior military colleges in the nation. Cool. Um, and so that just further developed, you know, and this was, I did not have the traditional, you know, college experience. Yeah. Uh, it was a, a senior military college. And so mm. Um, we wore uniforms to, uh, to classes every single day. We had room inspections. We did, you know, PT, uh, three times a week and all sorts of other things. And so, uh, it was a normal school, yeah. um, but with just a, a very developed ROTC program where you just, you know, learn leadership, you're, you're put in position, you're put in charge of, of cadets, mm-hmm. um, and, and you just grow and develop doing that. What was that like for you? Cause I feel like a lot of people you know, leaving high school, they're eager to go to college and make a bunch of bad, bad decisions, you know, <laughs> like yeah, with that yeah, quote yeah. unquote college experience. And so, I, I mean, it sounded like, it sounds like you had a pretty good head on your shoulders at, at that age. And, um, you know, it wasn't a problem for you to kind of deny yourself that, but what, what would you say to other people that, you know, say no to this opportunity, say no to ROTC because they want to experience college? So uh, what, what I would say is for me, um, you know, I, I I was kind of like a good kid growing mm-hmm. up. I didn't have a lot of the, I don't know if it was just my mom beat it into me or, or <laughs> what it was, but, you know, I didn't have a desire to go out and, yeah. you know, drink all, drink all day and skip mm-hmm. classes and do all that kind of stuff. I, I you know, I just yeah, did what I was supposed to do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for anybody, and I, I can't fault anybody for wanting to go to college and, you know, experience some things because you're young, you're dumb, you know, you want to have some fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is what it is. Uh, but you know, there, there are opportunities to, to do that, but still, you know, excel in your classes and, and, you know, put yourself forward. Yeah. And, um, you know, ROTC is not for, and my situation is different just because I went to a senior military program, but there are ROTC programs throughout the nation of various and universities. And you can do that. Some schools are just, you know, they just have an elective, it's just a class. Mm-hmm. And then you can still go on and be a full-time normal college student. So it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily impede and you know, your day-to-day activities. Yeah. So you can, you can have, you can have both. Okay. Yeah. You can have your, have your cake and eat it too. I think it's, right, exactly. Uh, it's just, I think it's, you know, like anything in life, it's knowing where that line is as to like, yeah, yeah you can have fun, but you can also be responsible, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've heard good things about the program. Um, and so you, you graduate, what year did you graduate? I graduated college in 2013. 2013. Yeah. And then at the end mm-hmm. of that, you got a commission did it, did it, uh, dictate where you went for your job at all? Or was it kind of, you still got the opportunity to, to decide that? Yeah. So part of the process as you're commissioning through ROTC, um, you kind of assess, 
so there, there's you know a time period where you are essentially ranked amongst other ROTC cadets throughout the nation. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how you kind of choose, you know, what, what branch you're going to, it determines what branch you're going to get, you know, maybe duty location that you mm-hmm. want. Um, so there's all these criteria that goes into like your evaluation, GPA being a huge piece of it. You know, there's an advanced camp that you have to go to and your, your leadership skills are evaluated, et cetera. Um, and so essentially what they do is they put you on an OML or a merit list. So, there's a number one cadet in the nation for that year. And then there's a, you know, the 10,000th cadet in the nation for that gotcha. year. And, you know, the top 10%, they are guaranteed active duty or they're guaranteed to go to their first duty assignment um, of preference or whatever it is. People in the middle, you kind of just like, it, it comes to like a, a needs of the army kind of thing. Like you can, sure. you know, you have, I want to do this, 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 and this. And the army can, you know, just based off of what allocations they have for that year. They can yeah. say, yeah, we'll give it to you. We'll give it to you. Others, nah, we don't have any of those. So you're going to have to do this or whatever. Mm. Um, so I was actually lucky. I got my, my branch, which is human resources. I commissioned as a human resource officer and that's what I wanted. Cool. Um, so, so I got that. Um, and then, yeah, I just, you know, I, I, I kind of moved around a little bit. Some plans changed as far as like where my initial duty station was going to be, mm-hmm. but I, I think it, it, it was all for the better, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Did you, did you feel that pressure? Like knowing that the top 10% got basically whatever they wanted while you were in college, did you, or were you constantly like under that pressure of like, if I don't succeed and get the top 10%, they're going to send me to like the crappiest yeah. place with the crappiest job, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. how was that for you? So for me personally, honestly, no, um, because if I remember correctly, it's been a minute, but yeah. if I remember correctly, part of my ROTC scholarship I think I was guaranteed active duty. Okay. So some of my peers in school, they were competing mm. um, because some of them wanted to go active, but you know, they ended up going either guard or reserves. Yeah. So they, they were competing, but me, because I had that scholarship, I'm pretty sure I was locked in guaranteed to go active duty okay. um, for as, as far as job though, I still had to compete for the job. Uh, so what I did was, you know, there, are, there's always programs out there. So the army, you can, you can add. So for a branch, which is essentially, uh, at so being an active duty service obligation. So I told the army, I said, Hey, if you guarantee me that I will be a human resources officer, I'll mm-hmm. give you three years of active duty time on top of my contract for my ROTC scholarship. Cool. And so okay. it's up to the army to say, okay, we'll take that offer. Here's your mm-hmm. human resources. You was three years, or they can say, actually, no, you know, based off of our needs, you know, we're going to put you and we're going to make you a whatever officer mm-hmm. as opposed to human resources. So, so our, the army offered my, my, my requests. Um, they made me human resources and I gave them three extra years and here, here I am. That's wild. And, and I think that's a good representation of the reality of which like the leverage you have as somebody joining mm-hmm. the army to say, this is what I want. Can you make it happen or not? And so yeah. I think a lot of people kind of go there. I mean, it's super intimidating. You know, I mean, for anybody. Um, and so if you're 17 years old, 18 years old and trying to enlist and you don't know anything, you know, you, you, mm-hmm. you don't think that you have the ability to ask that kind of question. Like that's a, that's a pretty far reach. It's the military. You take what you can get, but yeah. And, and, and it follows you throughout your entire career in the army. Mm-hmm. You know, some people kind of like go through their time in the army and the military and they just, they let life happen to them yes. uh, yeah. while others, you know, they say, Hey, this is what I want to do. And these are the steps that I want, I'm going to take in order to get that. Yeah. So my entire career, essentially I have been influencing you know, the army to send me to different locations, different yeah. jobs. And I, I, I'm by no means saying that it's always going to work out for mm-hmm. everybody because it, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, but it did for me, you know, everywhere that I have been has because I have wanted to go there. Mm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it's I, I feel like the people that get out after one contract and are disgruntled are the ones that they didn't put in an effort to, you know, go where they wanted to go they just allowed the military to give them orders wherever the orders went and you know to a degree Mm -hmm. yes you have to accept that um but there's always there's always a way to kind of strategize your your career and and push for what you want and it's it's about you know performance and if you're performing and you have leaders that are going to vouch for you then you have a lot more you know ability to get where you want to go. So yeah hundred percent and sometimes you know sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot Mm -hmm. um because you know I I've as an HR officer, you know, I kind of help other officers, you know, with career management and all sorts of things. Um, and I, I noticed that there's, there's a, you know, a typical, some officers, you know, we have branch managers. So each branch, whether it be infantry or 
uh, artillery, HR, um, logistics. We all have branch managers and at the uh, the Army Human Resources Command. So they they manage a population of of officers within a specific branch, mm. and they kind of control. You know, historically they've kind of controlled your next assignments. They're the ones that's facilitating that. Yeah. And so it's 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 funny because people have always been like you know, coming to me as an HR officer for career advice. And I'm like, have you speaking, have you spoken to your, your branch manager at all? And they're like, no, I, I get told by, you know, X, Y, Z person not to talk to them because they're just going to get upset and they're going to send me here or they're going to send me where they don't want to talk to me. I'm like, no, it, it yeah. is your career. That's your branch manager. You need to be proactive and reach yeah. out to them. Otherwise, you know, it's, you're just going to get what's handed to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, those people are, you know, it, it it's kind of, I remember it, it, it just seeming kind of like smoke and mirrors. Like, yeah, there's this monitor out there somewhere that decides my life, <laughs> but like, yeah. you know, you never, you rarely actually meet them, meet the individual and right. meet those people that can actually make those decisions for you. Uh, but the reality is that you, you can contact them and you can ask, you know, you can try, yeah. but it's, it's never a guarantee, but it's always worth trying. Absolutely. Uh, so what is your, you've been in what, eight years now? I hit eight years this coming June. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And so what is what is the past eight years looked like for you? I mean, I know that's a you know to go year by year, week by week, but it's, uh, uh, give us an it's, idea. It's, yeah, it's been busy. It's <laughs> been a busy eight years. Yeah. Um so initially when I joined, uh so when officers joined, they initially have to go to Bullock, their basic officer leader course, and that's mm-hmm. to learn your specific job. Right. So that initially was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, uh, where I learned the fundamentals of being an, an army HR officer. Mm-hmm. Um, I initially had orders to go to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, um, to the 82nd Airborne Division. But, you know, three weeks before I was supposed to graduate from my basic officer course, I got orders diverting me to go to Fort Carson, Colorado, mm-hmm. uh, with the 4th Infantry Division to deploy with them as part of an SFAT team, a security force advise and assist team. Mm-hmm. Um, and these were, you know, the ar- back then the Army took, you know, officers and enlisted from throughout the Army. And they, they kind of plussed up a, a brigade mm. um, and those, uh, that brigade that was deploying and with the intent of those individuals um, creating SFAT teams in order when they deployed to, to um, advise and assist, you know, the, the local uh, police, uh, army, um, and, and, and those kinds of individuals. And so that, that, was, that was my first assignment. Like I said, I, I got diverted to go there. I kind of fought a little bit. I was like, man, I just joined the army. I've been in the army for like a day. And then you're sending me to like <laughs> yeah. this infantry unit to deploy and yeah. like advise these people. I don't know what I'm doing. So at that and point, so the, <laughs> were you even an HR officer when you got there? Or they said, okay, I mean, all of a sudden you're an barely, infantry officer. I, barely I was an HR officer. Wow. But but, but yes, yeah, I mean, I was an HR officer. So I went to be, you know, a specific team's HR subject okay. matter expert. And so my responsibility would have been to uh, advise and assist, you know, the local whatever local Afghan um, army or police and to, you know, whatever that we mm-hmm. were teamed with, I would advise them uh, on HR operations in the, in the army. Huh. Um, and so that actually didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> I did go to Fort Carson, Colorado. I did do all the SFAT training. Um, but after I came back from Christmas block leave, I got there in September after just, you know, I got back in January from Christmas block leave. Uh, I got told by my boss who was a Lieutenant Colonel in 05 said, Hey, one of the HR officers for, you know, one of the, one of the infantry battalions, um, in the brigade, she broke her back over Christmas block leave and they need an HR officer to deploy with that specific battalion to manage the HR functions for that battalion. And they're like, well, now we have all these, you know, all these extra people here that came here for SVET, but we're going to pull you down and you're going to deploy with that battalion as their HR officer. Mm. So that's what I did. Um, I showed up, you know, to my unit, I met my, my NCO IC, and I was like, hey, I'm second Lieutenant Williams. You know, I'm going to be deploying with you guys. She was like, hey, sir, welcome to the team. Pack your bags. You're leaving in three weeks. And I was like, oh, <laughs> all right. Well, Sweet. here we go. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Hit the ground running at that point. Yeah. And so deployed, came back, um, got new orders to Fort Bragg. I ended up going to the 82nd um, and did that for three years. Uh, went to my captain's career course once I got promoted to captain, which is just intermediate level. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just a reinforcing higher level, uh, of fundamentals essentially for your job. Sure. And then, uh, following that, I got assigned to be an HR officer in the the first battalion, seven special forces group in Florida, Mm. did that for two years and then got an assignment here and here I am in Los Angeles. Okay. Right on. And so, I mean, you, you said earlier that you kind of got everywhere you went, you, 
you decided like you you wanted that that, mm-hmm. uh, that station i mean like how <laughs> how, how did how yeah. did you make that happen <laughs> yeah yeah so it's just like i was saying so like mid-deployment initially um i contacted my branch manager and I was like, hey, I was really looking forward because I originally, like I said, I originally had orders to go to the 82nd once I joined the Army. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's the 82nd Airborne Division, very sure. historic organization, yeah. you know, um, legends. And so I was like, I really want to go. I'm going to jump out of airplanes and do all this cool guy stuff. Yeah. Um, and so mid-deployment, I contacted my branch manager. I was like, hey, you guys screwed me. You sent me on this deployment without <laughs> me wanting to come. You're going to send me back to the 82nd. And they were like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, and I got orders to go to the 82nd. So uh, I did that um, for three years. I was a, an HR officer at an infantry battalion for two years. And then I went up to the two-star level and I was in the, the G1 section, cool. um, which, you know, managed HR for the entire division. Did that for a year. And then um, actually after Captain's career course, um, I had made contacts while I was in the 82nd Airborne. Mm-hmm. Um, my HR technician uh, that I was working with, he, you know, we got to become really close and he was down in seven special forces group as their HR tech. And so when he saw that I was approaching my cycle to PCS uh, from my captain's career course, you know, he reached out, he was like, Hey, we got a position here in the seven special forces group. And I was like, Oh man, absolutely. Special forces, you know, yeah. it's going to be cool. I'm going to go there. There's going to be a bunch of cool guys and like <laughs> life's going to be good. I'm going to show up, do my job and then go home, yeah. you know, without people like yelling at me and telling me to do all these crazy things. And so I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so mm. next, you know, I'm on orders to the seven special forces group. And then did that for two years. And this job, uh, this was actually my number two assignment. My number one before I came here was my number one was Hawaii. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to go to U.S. Army Pacific Command, but that didn't work out. But this was my number two. So, sure. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, California good enough, bad. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right on. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's interesting to, you know, for some people to understand that, like, you're an HR officer, but because you got attached to Special Forces, it affords you unique opportunities that are within special forces. So like you mm-hmm. said you went to jump school, right? I did. So I went to jump school as a cadet actually. Oh, no kidding. Um, so yeah. So when, when I was still in college, I went to jump school. Um, and huh. then, yeah, that kind of put me on a path to be in airborne assignments because 80 seconds, obviously airborne and, and the SF group is airborne. So yeah, yeah, I was on the airborne status for like about five years. I want to say. So all right, let's back up a little bit. Cause I'm curious. I mean, how, how did you get the opportunity to go to jump school as a cadet? Like, why would they pay for you to do that? <laughs> I don't remember, to be completely honest. Okay. Uh, I just knew there was an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess they asked and it was like, hey, who wants to go to airborne school? And I was just like, me, that sounds yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I really don't remember all the specifics, but I, I definitely volunteer. It's an, it's a volunteer thing. You have to volunteer for airborne school. And I did. Okay. And I ended up getting a slot. I don't know if it was because I was somewhere on an OML or, or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, but it worked out. And next, you know, I've been jumping out of airplanes for five years. Right on. I feel like that's a common question. Like when I say, you know, somebody asks like, oh, you're in the military. Like, did you get to jump out of planes? It's like, well, no, yeah. I didn't. But I know like people do. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, I've, I have pr- plenty of friends, plenty of friends that uh, do it. And I hear mixed things about it. So I'm curious, like mm-hmm. what uh, what your experience with it has been. And, and you know, is it as sweet as as uh, you maybe thought it would be? So I will tell you that every single time I jumped, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> that, that is the absolute truth. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I'm, I'm not afraid of heights, I would say, but sure. um, it, it's just one of those things. I mean, but you, you do it so many times. You have so many reps, you know, your, your adrenaline is going, so you know what to do. Yeah. Um, and so it, you just happen. It's, it's funny, though. It's, it's a cool experience. Uh, I don't regret it at all. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny because there is some like, if you go on like YouTube and you search for airborne, you uh-huh. know, jumps or whatever, you see all the cool stuff, you see the cool parts <laughs> of it, but what you don't see is like the 24 hours leading up to it where yeah. there's a whole, like you getting like rigged up and yeah. sitting in the harness shed for hours yeah. and then doing all the rehearsals <laughs> and all that other stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, but jumping's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. There's like, what, like, uh, you know, probably 18 hours of work for a five minute jump, you know? <laughs> oh, e- easy, easy. Yeah. E- even if you, if you get to jump, you know, yeah. and yeah. there's some times where, you know, like you're doing all this pre jump stuff. And then next, thing you know, you're sitting down waiting, waiting, waiting for the mm-hmm. birds or the door is broken or the yeah. engine, something or something, whatever happens. And next, thing you know, up, oh, sorry, the jump scratched and, you yeah. know, 24 hours is just gone and you don't even get to jump. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. It happens. It, it Yeah. That's the, that's the nature of the military, you know? 
Yeah. Um, so I just to go into that a little bit more, uh, you know, I, within the military, I think a lot of people may understand that there's there's a lot of different types of jumps. So there's like, you know, static line, free fall, you know, then free fall, all kinds of cool stuff down there. But like, mm-hmm. what did you go to free fall static line or, or what what type of jumps were you doing? So I did purely static line. Okay. Uh, typically, the only time I experienced anybody doing free fall jumps was when I went to um, uh, Seven Special Forces Group. Yeah. Um, because because usually all the SF guys they have to go to free fall school. Mm-hmm. Well, they don't have to, but they go to free sp- free fall school before they even show up to a uh, an SF unit. Yeah. Um, and so they're all free fall qualified, and um, some of them have the opportunity of serving on a free fall team. Mm-hmm. Um, because just, just because you're free fall qualified doesn't mean you're going to be doing free fall jumps all the time in an yeah. SF group. Um, but there are specific teams that are designated as free fall teams, just like there's a dive team. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, they will get their, their free fall jumps in all the time, but no, I was, I was purely, I was purely uh, static line. Cool. Do you want to, uh, just let the listeners know, kind of explain the difference between static line and free fall? Yeah. So static line is, um, essentially you have your parachute on and, you know, you're hooked up to your, your static line. And then, uh, when you're in the aircraft, you know, you have your, um, it's essentially like a hook where you hook on to the inside of the aircraft. There's a cable that runs along the side of the aircraft. And then once you hook on the other side is attached to your parachute. So essentially all you do is, um, you you essentially just got to jump, right? You're going through the aircraft. And once you jump out the door, that that static line that's attached to you it, it just unravels and it pulls open and activates your parachute so you just go you jump out and it pulls open and next thing you know boom there's a parachute above you uh free fall is what you typically see on the, on the cool guy stuff where they just kind of like you know the back of the aircraft opens up and they just jump out they're not attached to anything it's, it's just kind of like skydiving yeah yeah right on yeah, I, yeah, I, you know, I didn't know that with the difference between those before I joined. So yeah, uh, I and, and that, static line that you know you, you jump, oh, it's a lot lower altitude. Free fall, they're they're way up there. Yeah, yeah, very true. Awesome. So I, I'm curious, like what what has been the highlight of your career to this at this point? I mean, it sounds Ooh, like you've done some cool stuff and and kind of got yeah. most of what you wanted. Um, you know what's been yeah, what's been the highlight? Um, highlight. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's one specific, I, I've definitely done some cool things, you know, mm-hmm. going back to being in the airborne community. Um, you know, I've had an opportunity to do some giant exercises, you know, one in particular that comes to mind is operation Trident juncture, which I think that was in 2015. Um, back when I was in the 82nd, uh, we did, it was like, I want to say it happens every year or every other year, but it's a giant NATO exercise. Mm. Um, and that year it was the largest NATO exercise that has happened in like a decade or something like that. Wow. Um, where all the NATO countries, they come together and we have this, this, this whole event over in Europe and, um, it's, it lasts several days and the culminating event for, for that, for that specific operation that year was us, the second airborne division jumping in, uh, to Spain, to Zaragoza, Spain. So like mm-hmm. one day, you know, I show up to Fort Bragg, North Carolina with all my gear, get in an aircraft, we fly over the, the ocean and then next, you know, I'm jumping out of the airplane into Spain. So cool. that was, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, not necessarily related to the military, but I've had an opportunity to travel, um, mm-hmm. to different parts of parts of the world, um, which, which I love international travel. Um, I'm obsessed with, you know, going to New Zealand and Australia. So I've been to those places a couple of times. Nice. Um, and, and so like, it, it's just been an amazing experience. Awesome. Awesome. That reminds me, I think, um, isn't there annually a jump at Omaha beach kind of like, a you know, a world war two remembrance. Yeah, the there is. Does? Yeah, there is. Yes. And I actually have a friend that participated in, I'd say one or two of those. Cool. Um, but yeah, they, they, they definitely do that. They jump into Normandy. Yeah. 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 You weren't, uh, you weren't able to get on that. that no, I was not Mm-mm. right on, right on. Um, what, what is like, what would you say is a highlight opportunity that you found within the military that you, that you feel like, you know, is, is easily, you know, repeatable that somebody could pursue. So I feel yeah, like a lot so, of us kind of fall into unique opportunities um, mm-hmm. and we kind of like make it up as we go. We learn, but you know, if you had like a highlight opportunity that it's like, Hey, yeah, if you want to do this, then do this <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. So I know that you are, are very big on 
you know, like personal finance and, and that kind of thing. And so I am a huge advocate for, you know, personal finance and using the military yeah. um, to, you know, benefits, you know, to your advantage, essentially. Yeah. And, and being in, being in active duty, being in the military has some awesome, you know, financial benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not a subject matter expert by any means, but, you know, using the VA loan, for example, to, to purchase a house. Yeah. Um, you know, I did that in my last duty assignment when I was stationed in Florida. Nice. Um, I showed up, I purchased the house. Um, brand spanking new four bedroom, two bathroom, 2,200 square feet, Dang. you know, and, and I knew, you know, cause I was already sort of on this path towards, you know, personal finance and financial independence and, you know, mm-hmm. building wealth. And so I knew I wanted to make that an investment property when I PCS later on. Yeah. And so, uh, I, I got the house, I was living in it, you know, I got some roommates at some point. So I was doing a little bit of house hacking kind of thing, you know, cool. getting some income for that. Um, and I've since obviously moved and it's currently being rented out right now for, nice. for a good amount of money. Um, you know, tenant is completely paying off my mortgage and I'm actually profiting like 600 bucks a month, you know, just yeah. from, and I, and I didn't pay anything out of pocket for this house. Yeah. You know, this was a brand new house. It was a nice house, $0 out of pocket for me. And I'm using other people's money to help increase my net worth and, and build wealth you know, while I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs, you know, I have a property manager. And like I said, even after the property manager expenses, yeah. uh, I still, I still profit like 600 bucks a month. Yeah. And so, and that's, that's just one thing. So like, it's always funny when I'm online and I can see all these, you know, all these headlines and articles of millennials and, you know, <laughs> their millennials never crashing the housing market and millennials don't yeah. own houses and then millennials this. And I'm like, it's not me. I'm good. You know? And so, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, thanks to, thanks to the army for sure. Yeah. Um, for affording that uh, that opportunity. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm a I'm a big advocate for uh, you know, obviously strategically using the VA loan. Um mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm curious, like a lot of you know, a lot of people think that the the landlord life is is dangerous, you know, <laughs> risky kind of thing. Uh how did you start down that track? I mean, what resources were you pursuing to 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 get a better understanding of uh, you know, that strategy? Yeah, so I um I, I didn't get into the whole personal finance thing until I want to say it's probably been like four, four or five years ago is when I really started getting into that, you know, that path for financial independence. And uh, it's funny I, I, uh, how I kind of started was a buddy of mine when I was getting ready to PCS from Fort Bragg approached me who I hadn't seen since college. Mm. And he was telling me about, you know, entrepreneurship and building wealth and this and that. Long story short, it was one of those like multi-level marketing things. And <laughs> oh, like, he, so he really, funny. he got me, he got me. He really did. I was like, man, this is awesome. I'm going to be, I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to be a business owner, yeah. I'm, you know, be financially independent. You know, he brought me around his, his crew and like, it was, you know, millionaires, people who have been in the business for a while and yeah. they were super successful. And so that kind of like started my journey. He, he really built me up when we had that sick He said, man you don't have any debt and you know, you're like, you're an officer in the army. You got all this money coming in and blah, 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 no expense. And you know, it was this whole thing. Yeah. And so it, it was really funny. But so since that, that is essentially what prompted me on that journey. So I started looking up, you know, um, and, and reading about personal finance, obviously, you know, the staples, Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad, sure. and, um, the cash flow quadrant and all those things looking into how to build wealth, you know, this whole, um, biggerpockets.com and you know is out there's oh, yeah. huge into real estate and obviously real estate being one of the biggest and best ways to build wealth especially generational wealth yeah. and so it, it, it's just increasing that financial literacy mm. and, and being motivated and knowing that end goal of financial independence and escaping the rat race you know it really motivated me yeah. and so and and on it sometimes you know it, it there is inherent risk to investing you know mm. um by nature of investing there are some risks but you have to understand as a person like where do you draw the line? Where are you comfortable? Where are you not comfortable yeah. um, with this real estate? Isn't for everybody. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not um, investing in the stock market may not be for everybody. Um, some people might want to do both, but you have to be able to come to that conclusion by increasing your knowledge. Yeah. Um, and like I said, your, your financial literacy so you can make that decision for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I, I, I think I don't know. I, one of the reasons I love the military so much, and especially for like the, you know, the age I was in active duty, it was just so good because like a, a normal job, you know, other coworkers and managers aren't really like helping you pursue any mm-hmm. kind of entrepreneurial efforts or, you know, further educating yourself. It's just kind of like do your job 
and go home, you know? But in the military, yeah. if you have good leaders and or if you want to be the good leader to like help, you know, young men and women set themselves up for success. It's like everybody's there, like, yeah, to do your job, but everybody wants to help everybody succeed at the same time, you know? So there's a unique opportunity to to do your work, but also have your entrepreneurial, you know, spirits and efforts kind of underway and and at use also. That doesn't exist like in a civilian job. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And and really, you know, you can help propel that by surrounding yourself with like-minded people. Yeah. You know, when I, when I left my job as a HR officer in the, in the 82nd, um, the person who replaced me, who's a, a fantastic, like a really good friend of mine right now, uh, Shelby, she is, she has since left the military and she was on this, it's funny because I called her one day. I was like, yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, personal fi- fi- financial independence and you know, fire moving and all these things and building. And she was like, Oh my God, me too. And so she was like, I'm getting out. I'm going to start, you know, my real estate empire, which she did. She got out, she was an agent. Um, and she was like number one agent, um, in the area for Keller um, Williams. And then she ended up leaving there, becoming a CEO, building her own business, uh, her own real estate business. And she's just kind of like destroyed the, the Fayetteville, North Carolina, wow. like housing market, like she's crushed it. And uh, she opened up a new firm in like Charlotte and is expanding. Different. And so it's like having that, you know, kind of like person in my life, just like yeah. doing all these things. I'm like, Oh man, uh, yeah. what am I doing? I gotta, you know, I gotta, yeah, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta do some stuff to, you know, keep up with her. And yeah, and yeah she, she would probably be a fantastic person to, to, um, to come on here and, and talk about, about that kind of stuff. I'll see if I can hear it about, but yeah, having that kind of person, like, around you it it definitely pushes you to become a better person absolutely yeah choose your choose your friends wisely kind of thing yeah yeah absolutely i'm i'm curious i I laughed when you said the whole multi-level marketing thing because it's so funny man it's so funny just like in hindsight you know yeah and it's like you don't really know what it is and then all of a sudden it clicks you're like wait a second yeah you're you're selling to me right now what yeah (laughs) i thought this was like a you know a casual meetup you know it uh, was, it was, cra- I, I was in it for a while too. And I was all about it. And I went to the little meetings that they yeah. had and everything. And then after a while I was like, okay, this, this just isn't for me. Yeah. And then like, and then I started hearing about, it. I was like, all oh, these multi-level marketing things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I was like, oh man, that's what that was. Okay. So in hindsight, I, <laughs> but at the same time, like I can't, I can't be upset about it because like yeah. I said, that was probably one of the first things that have propelled me to start that journey for financial independence. And so it, it just, it all, you know, it all fell into place. So it sounds, I mean, so you went, you went further into it than I did. I, I was like this, uh, I'm good, but I'm, yeah. I'm curious. Cause you, I mean, you, in one regard, you speak highly of it cause it, it kind of pushed you in the right direction, but you also had a point where you realized like the same for me. So mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm just curious your experience with it. <laughs> what made it not for you? It was, so it's, I don't know the, the, in my head, the business model kind of made sense. Mm -hmm. Like I I looked at it and I was like, okay, I think this is something feasible that can work. However, I don't think it could work for me. Mm, Um, you know, I, I, it just wasn't for me that my kind of personality, uh, to go around, you know, essentially was talking to people and just getting other people to join the business. Right. So like I would put my, I would put money into the business and you know, the people that brought me in, they would, they would profit off of that. And so it's essentially you just going around and getting as many people as you can to put money into your business yeah. and then helping them to be able to scale their business uh-huh. so they can get money <laughs> off the people. And then it just keeps, it compounds like that over. So like, it makes sense if you yeah. got a whole bunch of people that actually everybody is involved and put money into the business and whatever, but like, just even now, just thinking about it, just me going around and every time like I uh-huh. meet somebody new, Hey, what do you want to, yeah. you know, see this business <laughs> venture thing that I got going on? It's like, that's just not you know? Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. You know, I, apparently some people do well with it, but uh, it's not for everybody, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so I'm, you know, at, at eight years in, uh, it sounds like you've done well. What is, do you plan on continuing? Do you plan on going to 20? I mean, what, what are you thinking? No. So that was the plan initially when I, when I decided to join the military. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I have recently just made some, you know, obviously life altering decisions. So I I will be, this is going to be my last year in the military and I'll be separating at the end of this year. Um, complete. What's next? Yep. Yep. So what, what's next for me is I'll actually be leaving and, um, I will be going to get my master's degree. I've actually recently been accepted to the university of Sydney in Australia. 
Nice, um, and so, like I said, I, I love international travel. I've been to Austria. I love it over there. And so I got accepted to the school. Um, one, one fun fact, uh, just for your viewers who, who may not know, the post-9-11 GI Bill does, you, you can use that for, you know, foreign and private schools. Yeah. I didn't know that initially, um, but you can. It, it is capped um, for foreign and private schools. There's like an annual, I think about was like 25000 for tuition every single year now. Mm-hmm. And their, your housing allowance is capped every single month. It's like $1,800 or something roughly. Really? Um, but you can use those benefits for foreign schools. Um, so I plan on using that when I get out to get my master's degree. I might get another master's degree, just seeing how I've, it's been like eight years since I've been in college. So let's see how <laughs> well I do with the first degree. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's funny because there was actually just a, a law that was recently passed. I think uh, you know, former President Trump signed it in January where they expanded uh, the yellow ribbon program, mm. uh, which essentially is, is the universities can essentially make up a difference and work with the VA and they can provide some assist- uh, additional uh, tuition assistance for you yep. um, through the yellow ribbon program yep. um, that just got expanded also to foreign schools. Um, cool. And so that should be rolling out sometime here and in your future. So it looks like I may be going and get, you know, fully funded master's degree That's um, or two here in the next three years. And then, joining the, you know, joining the civilian sector after that. That's what's up. Yeah. I'm, that's actually, uh, my next video that I'm making is, uh, talking about the yellow ribbon program. Cause it's yeah, awesome. A good opportunity. Um, yeah. so it, it, it's interesting, man. I mean, you, so you got undergrad completely paid for by the army and mm-hmm. then you still have the GI bill available to you. Yep. So that's like, I mean, by the end of it, you're going to have like half a million dollars in education <laughs> for free, you know? And so it's funny because if I, if I work it right, I can potentially get like, cause you get three years of GI post 11 GI yeah. bill benefits. Right. And so mm-hmm. it's three years. That doesn't necessarily, it doesn't say one degree in three or three years. I can get, yeah. if I get three degrees and each degree takes a year to complete, that's three degrees. I can literally go and get three master's degrees, yeah. um, mm-hmm. which is kind of the plan right now. But like I said, we'll see how that works out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, fully funded, you know, undergrad and potentially two or three graduate degrees. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah, you can't beat that. Yeah. I was just talking to a, a buddy that uh, he's out in California and he's applying to, he, he talked to me into applying to it also. So mm-hmm. I'm about to apply to the, uh, it's a master's in business for veterans at USC. So okay. it's, it's basically a, an accelerated MBA, but for veterans, cause they, you know, they take your leadership experience and kind of yeah. chop off some classes. So it's like a 10 awesome. month program, two yep. weekends a month, crank it out. You know, you're getting mm-hmm. LA BAH and uh, oh, you, yeah. get, you get a basically an MBA in 10 months. It's like, dude, sign me up. <laughs> LA BAH is pretty nice. And that's, right. that's another little, that's another little hack out there. You yeah. know, yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, he's, uh, he's basically talked to me into maybe just flying out from the East coast to the West coast for two mm-hmm. weekends a month for 10, 10 months. Uh, I'll still have some BAH left to to make it happen. So you know, it's it's those kind of opportunities that you, like I didn't know about until I talked to somebody else who was kind of like mm-hmm. pushing the envelope a little bit, looking for those opportunities to to make the benefits work for them. And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if you have them, use them and uh, use them well. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. And that's one thing that we tell you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a recruiting company commander, and that's one thing yeah. that you know our recruiters definitely stress to our our applicants. It's like, hey what are your, your, you know, your short, your middle and your long-term goals. Mm. And let's, let's take those and let's see how we can get the army to work for you to attain those goals. You know, whether it be, okay, you want to end up getting out and doing something in the medical field Well, we can have, we have jobs in medical field where you can get all these like, you know, certifications and all sorts of things that will, you know, translate over to the civilian side. Once you, if you decide to get out, you know, so use the, use the army, use the military, um, to help you achieve your goals for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, it's, um, it's, it's just funny how in hindsight, you know, for you and I, it's like, it's a no brainer, you know, mm-hmm. but like for me, when I was 17, I signed up, I was like scared out of my mind. I'm like, what am I doing during the Marine Corps? Or like, what the heck yeah. do I do? Why would I do this? You know? Yeah. Um, and so it definitely takes that, that leap of faith and like, just, just send it, you know, like I, I, I used to think the whole send it thing was kind of annoying, but now in mm-hmm. life, I'm like, just, You're all about do it. It. just do it. Like who cares? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's <laughs> funny that you mentioned that hindsight because like, it's just one of those, I feel like that the old person now yeah. where I'm like, man, if I only knew back then mm-hmm. what I knew now. Yeah. And so I tried to, you know, I, I try to like instill some of that in my soldiers, but it's funny, especially once I start talking about like personal finance, you know, 
my like 70 year old, you know, 18 year old privates was like, Oh, sir, come on. What are you? <laughs> and we just, just yell at me and tell me to go back to work. I, yeah. okay. Where, what am I doing? TSP? Sure. Got it. You know, they yeah. did it. I'm like, oh, okay, how can I get to these kids? Know, but man, it, it's really, it's really funny. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So do what you can. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I like to close out with a, a number of, you know, kind of the standard questions. It sounds like you've traveled quite a bit, both in, you know, on orders and off orders. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, in, in both capacities, what your favorite place has been on and off orders that, you know, has happened and been an opportunity because of the military. Yeah. Um, so I like, I like, I like being here in, in LA. Yeah. Um, it's the traffic's getting a little bit worse <laughs> now before we were, we were operating under COVID traffic. And so yeah. like, it was not as bad, but it's starting to pick up now. Um, and also like, I, I wish I was here during, not during a pandemic where things were, you know, a little bit more open and, you know, everything was kind of shut down, but it's, it's nice out here. Um, and like I said, there was that opportunity over in, um, in Spain that I got to experience. That was, that was, that was awesome. But, nice. you know, I, I met some awesome people here in LA it's very different not being on an actual like military installation. Mm. Um, and, you know, just kind of being out in with normal people, you yeah. know, and experiencing normal people on the day. And so it's kind of refreshing a little bit, you know, yeah. um, I go to like a private gym and, you know, we do all these out, outdoor workouts and then it's the same people every single time at six in the morning, just only crazy people wake up that <laughs> early in the morning to go work out. Yeah, um, and so it's, it's really fun meeting all those people. Um, as far as, you know, not dealing with the military, not traveling with the military, like I said, I think by far New Zealand is probably like my favorite place in the world. Mm. Um, How'd you pick unfortunate. That? How did I pick it? Yeah. If it wasn't on orders, you're just like, I'm just going to go to New Zealand. Yeah. So I just, I, I think one year I, um, I was just watching YouTube and then there was just like, I don't know, I got probably, uh, a, a travel documentary dude like popped up and I like watched this video on New yeah. Zealand. I had always been like a Lord of the Rings fan. So there was always that interest there. Yeah. Um, but then I saw that and he was like traveling through and I was like, Oh man, this place looks cool. You know, I want to go. And then one day I just like, I was like, all right, I'm going to buy a ticket into New Zealand. And I just went yeah. and it was like by far the most amazing experience. And that was my first time, not including deployment, the first time I've ever traveled outside of the country. Nice. And so like, I, I met up with people from all over the world. We kind of toured through, you know, the North Island of New Zealand and, and some of those people that I, I went, this was in 2015. I want to say some of those people that I traveled with, I, I still like, you know, keep in contact with today and then we That's traveled awesome. to different, different places. And so mm. that was, that was, yeah, that was a, an experience that I, I'm so glad I just bit the bullet and just did, yeah. you know, cause I, I always came up with excuses like why I can't, okay, I can't take two or three weeks of leave mm -hmm. because of this, I can't do this. And then I was like, man, I'm just going to do it. And then exactly, I did it. And it's man. like, it was, exactly. it was the best decision I've ever made for sure. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, dude. Just freaking do it. You know, if you like, it, I've right? reached to the point where it's like, if I have a thought and like, yeah, I could come up with a million excuses, but just, mm -hmm. just do it. You know, kind of like this podcast. Like I thought about it like a year ago, probably over that. Yeah. And then eventually I was just like, well, whatever, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's been so awesome. Like I'm kind of obsessed with the place now, like not yeah. last year, but 2019, I went to New Zealand twice. I went to Australia once. Wow. Um, and so like, it, it's funny cause when I went to New Zealand in the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. uh, I, I went to a place and then I went to New Zealand at the end of the year and I went back to the same place. And so like some of the people there, you know, they recognize me and they're like, Oh, you're back. And I was like, okay. Oh my God. So, that's, so I'm now I'm like meeting people and you're like, local. you know, this random. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like one of them. I'm, I'm a Kiwi pretty much. So yeah, it was super awesome. awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. It's definitely on my bucket list to kind of uh, do the van life through New Zealand. Yeah. 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 I've heard, Absolutely, I've heard it's it's things. amazing. It's an it's an awesome country. Yeah, man, awesome. Good for you, man. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing about your experience in Australia, doing your, mm -hmm. your master's program, and uh, you know, using the benefits for that. That's that's freaking sweet. So yeah, I like to like to give people a picture, um, because I you know I I think that I you know I'm a pretty optimistic person. I have optimistic people on the podcast, so I it can often get painted the military as a very an awesome thing. Like everything's great, you know, and, but we mm -hmm. all, we all know that that's not the total truth and there's downsides to everything. So I, I like to kind of give a, a, you know, a spectrum of like your favorite times, you know, your best day in the military versus your least favorite times or worst day in the military. Yeah. So mm, I would say best days are, you know, I, I've met some awesome people in the military. Uh, I, I think that's one of the biggest benefits. Some of the friends mm -hmm. that I've made along the way are, friends that I will unquestionably have for like the rest of my life. 
Yeah. You know, and it's just one of those things where, you know, shared misery, you know, grieves that sort of like friendship and camaraderie. Mm -hmm. And, um, so like, I would say the best thing is like some of the people, um, that that I've met some of the networks that I've been able to build. Um, some of the worst times are, you know, it, it, obviously, like I said, I'm an HR officer. Um, I knew that it wasn't for me to go out there. I I had no aspirations or intentions on going on, you know, being a, a a super hua combat arms, (laughs) ranger, infantry dude that, you know, that wasn't in the cards for me. Um, but being a part of an infantry battalion, even though as a, as an HR officer, Mm -hmm. you know, I had expectations of, Hey, you're in the unit, you're part of the team, you know, you got to pull your way, you got to do what we do. And so there were some not fun days where we would, you know, the infantry battalion commander 05, like, Hey, we're going to go on a 25 mile ruck march, you know? And I'm just like, <laughs> we're going to do, do what now? And like, yeah, I didn't dad, sign up for on. this. So I got, <laughs> yeah. I want to be able to stand out of my office and look out the window at you guys, yeah. but no, here I am, you know, like uh-huh. leaving and we're, we're doing this 25 mile foot march. So that was miserable. I lost three toenails on that foot uh, march. Dude, um, and then rough, things like, it's like yeah, everybody yeah. else has been training for that. And then all of a sudden, yeah. you know, once a year, you got to go suck it up for like the yeah. longest ruck. <laughs> that, do, you know? And like jumping out of airplanes and then yeah. doing these following assignments in the middle of the night and then doing a 12 March, 12 mile March, you know, yeah. back to the headquarters. It's like, Oh my gosh, this is the worst, <laughs> but it's just one of those things, you know, you suck it up and you know, you're, you're in that moment, you are, you are one of the team. And so you just gotta, just gotta get over it. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> and I'm pretty fortunate if that's like the worst thing that's happened to me, you know, in the oh, military. Yeah. I'm very privileged. So yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. The uh, yeah, the best days and the worst days are all relative to each person and their experience. And uh, you yeah. know, that's that's why I like to ask because because some people's worst days are they're pretty bad, you know. Yeah. So um, it's all it's all relative. But awesome, man. Well, any any closing advice that you you know give to somebody who's young either enlisted or commissioned or you know thinking about joining the army yeah i would just say um you know if if you're already in or you're definitely set on coming into the military um networking is huge Mm. um definitely you know be a person who's a team player be a person that you would want to be around um and and build your network and you know make friends and, and, and enjoy the time that you have uh, when when you can have it. So, you know, the military is going to take their time when the military wants its time. So when you have time to, you know, take some time off and decompress, go traveling around the world, you know, like I do, take it. Um, and, and like I say, you know, build those networks um, because you, you never know when they're going to come um, back to, you know, in your favor in the future. Mm. Um, so, so definitely take that opportunity. Uh, for people who are, you know, thinking about joining, hey, go into a recruiter's office, come, you know, hit me up, you know, I I can put you in contact with some recruiters, some awesome recruiters. Um, and just ask, ask the questions, ask, Hey, these are my, my long-term plans. Like how, how can you, and how can the army, how can, you know, the military, you know, in general help me attain, you know, what I want to do, ask those questions, you know, and go in for no commitment. The internet, everybody has internet. And so, you know, you can always do your own research and then go in and verify with recruiters and, and, mm-hmm. and obviously just take advantage of all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even, you know, talking to recruiters, no commitment, you know, yeah. re- realize that like they might call you a couple of times afterwards, but they're not going to like harass you. <laughs> you no, no, no. So if, if you don't want to join after talking to them, then whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not even a recruiter, but here I am like trying to provide some, some insight for those that are thinking about it. So, mm-hmm. uh, just let everybody know that's listening. I don't actually care if you join, but I think it, it, it worked for me. So it might work for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate hearing your story and uh, I'm stoked for you and, you know, the next chapter. So uh, best of luck and we'll stay in touch. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Neville. Like I said, really inspirational guy. Uh, he's done a really good job for himself, uh, you know, through his military career and outside of his military career seen the world and uh is you know using his benefits strategically to get the most out of them and to continue to line himself up for unique experiences and uh you know increase his professional and personal uh resume so that he's you know successful in life in and out of the military so uh, i think we all have a lot to learn from him and you know if you want to follow him on instagram you can find out more in the link below and uh, kind of see maybe he'll document his journey in Australia pursuing his master's programs. So I hope you guys enjoyed that and we will see you guys next week. Also, before we go, I 
want to make sure that if you're listening on YouTube, you can also listen on all the po- all the podcast platforms, Apple, iTunes, Spotify. It's all there. And similarly, if you're listening on the podcast platforms, there's a lot more on YouTube that is not on the podcast. So uh, subscribe to the Military Bottom Line YouTube channel. And, you know, you can get, uh, I, I do videos about the GI Bill, Yellow Ribbon, Voc Rehab. Um, there's, there's a lot of additional information and, uh, you know, videos that are on YouTube that are not on the podcast platforms. So make sure you follow me there. And uh, for any updates, um, then also follow me on Instagram, Military Bottom Line. Hope you guys are well, and I'll see you guys next week.